guys! Today I'm going to review Slam's Lot. Stephen King, the best-selling author of Carrie and The Shining, takes you on a startling journey to Salem's Lot. Slam's Lot was broadcast in 1979 and is an American two-part miniseries. It's based on the 1975 novel by Stephen King. It was directed by Toby Hooper. Screenplay was by Paul Monash. Music by Harry Suckman. The production runs 183 minutes and cost $4 million to make. A sequel was made in 1987 called A Return to Slam's Lot. And a remake starring Rob Lowe was made in 2004. The 1979 TV movie now has a cult following and was well received at the time and is praised as one of the best Stephen King adaptations. Slam's Lot stars David Soule, James Mason, Lance Kerwin, Reginald and Bonnie Badalia. So it's about this vampire that moves into this American community, vampirizes the people who live there. Slowly, there's more and more vampires appear. And what Stephen King did with the novel is he transferred the traditional vampire that sleeps in coffins, frightened of crucifixes, comes out on a night, the traditional type of vampire, but he put it in a modern setting. And also the story's done totally seriously. It's not campy or silly. And the story's also kind of like two different subgenres: The vampire film and the haunted house film. But the haunted house aspects treated in more detail in the novel, not the TV movie. So the biggest change from the novel and the TV movie is the character of Barlow. In the novel, he's more your traditional Dracula type of character. Suave and sophisticated. But in this TV movie, he's more like a, a mute Nosferatu type of vampire. And it is quite sinister. It's great makeup and it's a great performance by Reginaldo. And he looks scary without makeup on. But when he's got this kind of blue look to him and, and the, the glowing contact lenses and the teeth, he's terrifying. He's one of the scariest vampires put to screen. And he has a great entrance scene. It's one of the biggest jump scares ever. <laughs> Eee, bloody hell, I was nearly touching cloth. Nearly bloody shit myself when I saw that. Unfortunately, the character of Barlow is underused, I think, in this production. There's only really three important scenes that he's in. There's his entrance scene. There's a scene where he does an attack on a house in the kitchen area where he attacks his family. And then there's the final scene where he, he gets staked at the end. So he's underused, which is a pity. He should have had at least another scene. So that's one of the only real disappointments with this TV production, that the character was underused. However, it could have a benefit because if he's underused, the audience don't get too bored seeing him seeing his screen presence and it also keeps the character mysterious so when he does appear it has a big impact however I would have given him at least one more scene so David Solo who's just recently passed away he's great in this it's one of his best performances it's a understated performance hey Phil that's Hutch bloody Starsky will pop up next <laughs> yes he will he was in Starsky and Hutch Bones you're right playing Hutch from 1975 to 1979. Great TV show. I've reviewed a few on the channel. Speaking of Starsky and Hutch, there's an episode called The Vampire, where this guy's supposed to be a vampire, and I wonder if the casting people saw that episode before they cast David Soul in Slam's Lot, because it seems a bit of a coincidence that he was in that episode. Just a little bit later, a few years later, he was in this. So it was clever casting at the time with them being a popular figure from Starsky and Hutch. The audience automatically associate themselves with this character because they used to see him on television. And he plays a writer who's writing about the house, a haunted house that he, he was once in when he was younger. There's a great scene when he's talking to this teacher about what happened to him years ago in the house when he was younger. And it, it's a monologue scene. 
And it just shows how good an actor he is because it's quite frightening even though you don't say anything. It's the way he tells the story about saying this apparition in the house that hung himself and the, the body turns around and he opens his eyes. <laughs> uh, great monologue. I think I saw Hubie Marston hanging by his neck. His face green, his eyes puffed shut. His hands livid. It was ghastly. And then he opened his eyes and he looked at me. So at the time David Soul he was also doing pop music. He's, he was a good singer actually. Hey, Phil! I know a way David Soul could get rid of all them bloody vampires. All he had to do was start his bloody awful singing. No <laughs> problems, he was a great singer, David Soul. But it sure brings out the love in your eyes. I also like the bit when he's talking to Susan about his wife that got killed a couple of years before. And it proves how good he is because it's understated. He's like, when he's talking about her, you can just tell that he's crying a little bit with his eyes. Whereas other actors that get milk the same, that have a hanky, woo, 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 woo. Whereas all, all he does is have a, a slight moisture in his eyes, and that's enough. And it, it's more effective than uh, someone going over the top with the scene. I think for me, the best um, performance is James Mason, who's playing the, the character of Straker. He's a servant for Barlow, and he's human. And he's like arranging everything for Barlow's entrance. So he sacrifices a dog. He sacrifices a young boy for him. It's a, a great performance because he's an evil man. And he also has a sarcastic characteristic to him. The scenes where he's talking to this policeman. Saying, oh, I feel safe. Like taking the piss. He takes the mickey out of David Soul's character being a writer. <laughs> oh, you're the writer. On vacation or vocation? There's also I... scenes where his character's scared. There's a scene where he's leaving the house and he pulls up in his car and he's taking deep breaths. I thought that was a good touch, that. Proving that um, even though he's evilly scared of the character of Barlow who's going to enter the house later in the story. So all the other characters are good as well. The character of Mark, who's a horror fan. The character of Susan's good as well. There's a good chemistry between her and Ben Mears. Good music as well. Good romantic theme when they're both together. Even Jeffrey Lewis pops up. That's the actor who's in a lot of Clint Eastwood films. And it's a good part as well. He plays a grave digger. And he gets vampirised. And the scene that he's a vampire sitting in a chair is chilling. Because of the use of lights on his eyes, like the, the, they had contacts, contact lenses in his eyes, and the way they shoot the light and on to the lenses makes the eyes glow. And it, it's a really well shot scene, that. And that's why the vampires in this story are so creepy, because of the, the, the light effect on the eyes. So there's some great moments in this. The famous bedroom scene where you have a vampire tapping on the window wanting to get in. And the boy lets him in and gets bit. And it happens a few times. There's about three scenes where the vampire's tapping on a window. I thought that was really well done, that. And I remember kids at school talking about that scene. It's kind of the most famous scene of the production. I also like all the scenes where Barlow was in, especially the kitchen attack scene. I thought that was brilliant. Especially the bit where he's confronting the priest. And the priest has a crucifix, but he doesn't have enough faith for the crucifix to work on Barlow. And the, the vampire just grabs the crucifix and crumbles it. I thought that was excellent, that. It proves how powerful the vampire is, the head vampire. And of course, James Mason's taken the piss out of the priest. Poor little boy. You can do nothing against the master. Stop, holy man! You cut the boy's throat. Back, back, holy man, back, shaman. Back, priest! 
So Toby Hooper, who's the director of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, completely different style from that film to this. And he did a great job as well. I like the use of Lighten, where he uses very sunny scenes and very dark scenes, so great contrast. And the sunny scenes are airy because you know that it's going to get darker later and that's when the horror starts. So when you see scenes of Ben driving around in his Jeep and you see a very brightly lit scene where it's sunny, it's a bit airy because you know it's not going to be pleasant when it gets darker. There's also a scene where Mark's tied up and he's trying to get out of these knots before it gets dark outside. And in the novel, loads of tension as it describes it getting darker and darker. So, well, it's faults though. It is over three hours, which is a, a little bit too long. And with it being a TV movie, some of the sets look a little bit too obvious, a little bit on the cheap side. Apart from that, it's a perfect production. And I'd class this as one of the best TV productions made alongside Frankenstein, The True Story from 1973 and Count Dracula from 1977 that the BBC made. So they're like the big three. So out of 10, I'll give this one 10, 11. 11 out of 10. Is that good? You can go and see you like it. I thought it was bloody excellent, Phil. Top marks. Better than the bloody shit sequel and remake. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Like, subscribe and share. Bye. Bye.